Coronavirus, Saratorg, Eganamshin, Agus Hami, Eglet Kalishche, and we call even you, Gusho or Shachat. Before we begin, I would like to thank the staff of Ballon and Gale, the Highland Village Museum, and particularly Rodney Shason, Mary Jane Lamont, and Lamont and Shay McMullen for their support. I say this not least of all because this lecture you're about to hear was to have been delivered last August during Stardust of Alala workshops, but COVID got in the way and I'm delayed, delighted to be able to give it today. Okay. Um, I'd like to start with a brief summary, uh, the main headings of what we're going to be talking about. Um, a Gaelic proverb, a hero for our times, change in surviving it, turning points and new initiatives, uh, present resources, future directions. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Proverbs and tales. A good start for our talk today is the place on Cameron Mountain Road, Glendale, where we used to live. In those days, among the Gaelic speakers and others who stayed at the house and brought so much with them was Joe Neil McNeil, known to many of you as an outstanding Gaelic storyteller and recognized in Scotland in the 1980s as the best one living. Joe Neil was a constant and captivating source of information regarding nearly all aspects of Gaelic culture in Cape Breton. Yet even with his dedication and generosity, I, ex I, uh, I suspect Joe Needle uh, took an, event, uh, an immense body of Gaelic knowledge with him to the grave. For this reason, along with his own, en own energy and endurance, recording with him could be an exhausting experience. Yet to this day, I'm grateful for everything he told me and only wish I had been able to remember more. One item I did remember was a simple proverb, when the day arrives, so the advice, which was to serve as a guide and inspiration in negotiating the Gaelic world over the following decades. We shall return to it later in the talk. It sometimes seemed that Joe Neal thought in proverbs, particularly when uh, confronted with questions of human behavior or of the future. Um, in Gaelic society as elsewhere, problems were, uh, uh, pro proverbs were a handy way of emphasizing, encapsulating, explaining, or validating a point. And if you didn't happen to agree, the best response was another proverb. Proverbs can also be viewed as a verbal response to life situations and challenges. And indeed, there is no doubt concerning the importance of words in the Gaelic world. Back in the day, Joe Neal, myself, and Dr. John McGuinness of the School of Scottish Studies went out to visit another storyteller in the neighborhood, Patrick McEachern, known lo locally as Patrick Unishina. And in the course of the evening, Joe Neal recited a long classic hero tale that had not been heard in Cape Breton, probably for generations. Discussing Joe Neal's performance the next day with John McGinnis, John, John McGinnis observed that Joe Neal was busy constructing a verbal bulwark against what was widely perceived back then as the inevitable death of his language on the island. At the time, it seemed an understandable, but sad and ultimately futile exercise. Yet looking back over recent decades, words, 
especially in the Gaelic language, do not have to be objects to be powerful and effective tools. Let us recall what is known to every Cape, uh, Gael in Cape Breton not long ago. Gaelic culture is not con uh, concentrated on producing the great works in visual and plastic arts that are the rightful icons we see from other cultures. Instead, the cultural uh, monuments of Gaeldon, such as song, poetry, music, storytelling, are created and expressed through the medium of sound. It is a cultural medium that, when compared to the high culture of our neighbors, is subject to definite limitations. What we do not immediately see, especially in the case of a people who for centuries have been subject to outside rule, is the advantages it confers. It is eminently transportable, can be transmitted anywhere uh, from, from a palace to a prison, cannot be stolen or effectively legislated against, and always provides entertainment. <coughs> For many generations of Gales, the orally transmitted tradition has happily been shared by all and open to all. Indeed, at least since 1700 and the demise of the Gaelic aristocracy, the custom of universal access has been in place with none of the barriers and exclusivity associated elsewhere with high art. At the very most, it requires no equipment beyond a fiddle and or a set of pipes and a chair to sit on. For Gaelic community culture over three centuries and more, there have been none of the colleges or universities that are regarded as uh, necessary by other language groups. The institution of, uh, of instruction has been the Cayley House, usually within three miles of one's dwelling and attended by relatives, neighbors, and close friends. With a, with a context of the power of words, oral transmission and cultural history in mind, we may ask what is remarkable about our proverb? However old it is, it is bound to be a product of Gaelic history with its themes of disadvantage, poverty, and cultural disintegration. But to my mind, it is not so much a product of fear and deprivation as one of potential opportunity. It expresses an, an accommodating and easygoing attitude toward the future and its critical events that uh, is mentally at variance with the systems that have dominated the Gaelic world on both sides of the Atlantic. Next slide, please. One area in which the proverb, to which the proverb applies in real life, as well as in folk tales, is that of the hero. Heroes and heroines are featured in one form or another in every culture in the world, and the role is obvious. They serve as a means of validation of whole cultures and at the same time provide models to inspire and guide individuals. There is no culture known to me where the hero's role is more important than that of the Gael, where it is a constant center of attention, especially in song and story. The great warrior Phil Marcoule, to whom a whole pan-Gaelic story cycle was dedicated, is a memorable example. And some of these tales survived in Cape Breton until the 80s. Every community has produced its store of local legends told in hundreds of Cape Breton homes over generations, and some of which have persisted into our own lifetimes. If the need for heroes is universal, the search for one is primarily a concern of younger people, most notably younger men. As a young man born and bred in the American mainstream and attending a large cosmopolitan university, I was certainly no exception. Quite predictably, I looked among the learned faculty consisting of professors who, by their own accounts at least, were prominent experts or world experts in their fields. 
but the more I looked, the less likely it seemed to me that I would discover a gifted, courageous, and upstanding individual who could serve as uh, a kind of uh, as the kind of hero I sought. In spite of this temporary disappointment, however, my search did end successfully, and in one of the university lecture halls, where an experiment was being described. As I recall it, the lecture was on the capacity, or lack of it, in animals to use tools to get what they wanted. And the experiment illustrated sounded fairly simple. It consisted of a cage or enclosed compartment with walls, a ceiling, and a bare floor. A bunch of bananas was suspended from the ceiling at a certain height, and directly below the bananas, two six sticks separated which could be fitted together by a subject ingenious enough to think of it. The subjects were chimpanzees and bananas were placed high enough that they could not reach them by jumping, but low enough that they could be knocked down if the two sticks were fitted together. The compartment was surrounded by observation booths, peopled by psychologists, primatologists, and other distinguished researchers. The subjects were led in individually so that only one was in the cage at a time and their reactions were duly recorded. As we would expect, all of them looked first at the bananas, ignored the sticks on the floor, and in frustration made the appropriate noises and jumped up and down. This continued with a number of candidates until the introduction of a final subject who behaved somewhat differently from the others. When he was led into the compartment, he glanced up at the bananas, ignored the sticks, and then slowly sat down directly under the bananas. He remained that way without moving or looking at the booths for many minutes until one of the scientists conducting the experiment, likely frustrated by the subject's lazy unresponsiveness, left his booth and entered the compartment to find out what could possibly be wrong. As soon as he was at the center, the subject with lightning speed climbed up his back and snatched the bananas. Some people may regard the story, even if delivered in a respectable lecture hall, as apocryphal and far-fetched. But if our hero saw the planned procedure of the experiment as an insult to his intellect, I would have to agree with him. To put it simply, our hero focused on the bananas whether he could form the trick with a couple of sticks to please human researchers was entirely beside the point, so he didn't even bother. However, he figured it out. He used whatever was available, even if others didn't immediately see it, and not what was made available in a cage by people with their own agenda and little, if any, interest in his own needs. I rest my case. Uh, next slide, please. Our hero tale applies well to the history of Gaelic in Nova Scotia in the 21st century and should continue to provide a general guide and inspiration for its development during our lifetimes. To be sure, the present language scenario can be described by self-styled realists as dismal. These people will point to the usual array of statistics. These invoke, and rightly, such things as the decline of Gaelic as a community language, the decreasing numbers of first language speakers, and the additional arguments we dealt with in an earlier lecture on hard questions. But as my hero in the cage so acutely perceived, external indicators accompanied by outside interests are not the whole story. The usual reasons for the demise have to do with what we should accept as cut and dried truths, often delivered with just a hint of, of pitting con condescension, such as things always change, life is like that. Part of, the, uh, part of it, of course, is true, but it's a half truth. We are not dealing solely with a mere presence of change, but also the terms of change, especially in human society where responsibility is involved. 
we can put down part of the sense of change to a considerable nostalgia for the earlier world uh, in Cape Breton, which has been expressed by younger people as well as their elders. There is nothing new in the feeling. Uh, as a number of local uh, songs, even one composed what quite recently make clear. The singer Lachie McClellan from Dunvegan, Inverness County, once told me that the quality of his own Gaelic fell short of that of the 19th century generation raised in Broad Cove Parish. We must accept that some parts of the Gaelic world are now gone forever and will never be recovered. Prominent here is the loss of first language Gaelic speakers throughout the island, along with aspects of Gaelic uh, as a living community language featured in daily life and with all the language registers involved. At the same time, other aspects of Gaelic culture have persisted with remarkable tenacity. They include, and here they are on the list, Gaelic social skills, including conversation, humor, anecdotes, and acute appreciation of social context and a strong sense of community. Musical skills, dance, song performance skills, such as local singing styles and milling songs that are re-emerging among the young. Next slide, please. What other important changes have we seen over the past four to five decades? One of the most readily apparent has been a greater awareness of the value of regional Gaelic culture as evidenced by the programs supported by local institutions. This is in contrast to earlier imported models emphasizing the British Empire version of Imagine Highland, and does that mean Gaelic, culture complete with tartan artifacts for sale. With due respect all around, for Gaelic in this part of the world, its eclipse has been a fortunate development. Among younger people, the increased, increased use of the language and evidence of language skills. A greater number, still small but growing, of Gaelic speaking younger people greater access through information technology to global minority languages and cultures to provide a clear view of the major issues affecting our small corner of the Celtic world. An initiative successful elsewhere can make a difference here. And we'll see about that later in the lecture. Uh, next slide, please. Given the shift to a regional perspective and the maintenance or renewal of Gaelic culture through various forms of community, the necessary cultural resources are now identified as, exi as existing in the communities themselves. For community language maintenance, it is not an entirely recent development. Let us recall the contributions made several generations ago by Gaelic newspaper papers such as Machtawa and Moskvog that not only encouraged literacy in the language, but were listened to by countless family members and visitors gathered around a single reader. Many good songs transmitted by this means were cut out and carefully kept in private scrapbooks for future reference. Here we should note as well, the lively exchanges in Gaelic that were featured in the letters columns. Those who achieved literacy in the language published valuable songbooks of local bards, providing an irreplaceable internal record of community life. Such publications have been a great support uh, for the language and formed a basis for turning to regional uh, traditions as a living source for language and cultural teaching materials. So even though some of these were put together a century or even more uh, ago, uh, they're still valuable uh, to us now. The mid 1970s saw the development of teaching drawing largely on field work featuring talented local Gaelic speakers. The result among learners 
was a closer identification with Gaelic, drawing on locality, kinship groups, and an anecdote, and encouraging an enhanced sense of ownership of materials that they could view as their own. When the homegrown teaching perspectives of Gaelic and Nova Scotia were first proposed back in the days of the Nova Scotia gathering of the clans, they were routinely dismissed by those in control of culture in the province as radical. From the Gaelic perspective, and one extending to many of the world's endangered cultures, the approach has always been in fact deeply conservative, prioritizing the needs of ordinary people over those of formal institutions. As we are about to see, it provided a much different picture and a potentially devastating critique of government's routine treatment of the transmission of minority languages and cultures, taking us right back to the situ situation of our hero in the cage with the bananas. Why, we should ask, should access for the culturally disenfranchised to the living community language with its uh, worlds of social meaning, internal history, humor, and general humanity be limited in its transmission to the same impoverished and alien classroom environment used for teaching of dead languages such as Greek and Latin, not to mention cuneiform Hittite. Is the effort of fitting together the sticks of book literacy, formal grammar and prescribed sources, uh, what people out there uh, really uh, see is necessary? And is it all that much fun? Next slide, please. To my mind, the crucial turning point for Gaelic community developments was when Highland Village joined the Nova Scotia Museums Network and the primary emphasis for development and presentation was placed on the living Gaelic culture of the area. The new emphasis provided a productive focus for activity in Highland Village and beyond, with a provincial museum network providing the freedom and security for genuine innovation. What form did the innovations take? A quick review of programs will bring out their wide implications and some of the results for the future of Gaelic in all its aspects in the province. The answers are to be found online under various Gaelic programs in the province, and I would encourage people to explore them. We should note that many of the programs are the result of close cooperation between publicly funded institutions through funding partnerships. Under the guidance of the late Seamus Watson, Nova Scotia Highland Village Museum has developed pioneering community programs based on local materials that address, the, that address the needs ranging from young learners to older first language speakers. Programs are normally delivered through face-to-face -face contact, but have also, when necessary, worked well being delivered through information technology. Digital archives have also proved to be practical and effective resource uh, for uh, programs. Uh, next slide, please. One of the most successful of the grassroots initiatives is Bonus Bad, Root and Branch, a mentoring program mentioned by, uh, managed, I'm sorry, by the Office of Gaelic Affairs. Initiated in 2009, it provides the opportunity for Gaelic learners to work with Gaelic mentors and elders as they develop their language and cultural skills. The objectives of the mentorship program are, one, to strengthen links between Gaelic learners in Nova Scotia and our Gaelic elders. Two, to provide Gaelic elders with an opportunity to share their knowledge, cultural wisdom with uh, another generation of Gaelic speakers in Nova Scotia. Three, 
to provide Nova Scotia learners with an opportunity to be immersed in Gaelic language and culture and acquire by spending time with an elder, the linguistic and cultural foundation, the foundations of Gaelic Nova Scotia. Four, to reestablish the Cayley, that is visiting tradition in Nova Scotia. Next slide, please. The origins of the Bon Lispar Master Apprentice Program are interesting. In Nova Scotia, the concept grew out of an interest in communicative language teaching, known as CLT, approaches, with a primary goal to develop the speaking ability of learners. CLT teachers, who are more like language facilitators, use props and body language to convey meaning. Translation, reading, and writing are not part of this approach. Further guidance and inspiration came from the Master Apprentice Program developed for California's Indigenous Languages, where groups, in groups, where few, if any, uh, children were acquiring them. Uh, these, these languages, uh, Indigenous Languages in California, um, uh, a few of them have literally two or three living speakers now. Uh, the uh, uh, the decrease in, 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 in the speakers and consequently the languages uh, has, has been so steep. Among the recommendations from the California programs were for mentors to use normal speech in their language, to engage in normal Gaelic activities with apprentices through the language and for the traditional culture to be central, um, uh, a central means of acquiring the language. And uh, just in passing, uh, some of you, uh, uh, speaking of indigenous languages in California, some of you may be familiar with uh, the book about Ishi, who was uh, a native person in California, who uh, was the last of his tribe, but he was also the last speaker of his language. And after uh, his uh, brothers and sisters died and he was starving, he decided to come out of the canyon where he lived all his life and into the uh, modern world of California. Um, the anthropologists uh, at the museum there, uh, it took them a long time to figure out um, what family his language belonged to and then to find somebody who spoke another language that was close enough to it to be able to understand what he was saying. Uh, he ended up uh, doing quite well uh, because of his skills. Uh, they gave him a job at the museums uh, in, in California uh, where he showed people how to uh, make the various implements that he'd grown up with and so on. But this, this was the most, more famous cases in point. Um, about uh, language decline and the situations uh, that it can produce. Um, so uh, the use of the traditional culture to be a, a central means of acquiring the language. This last point, I believe, is of central importance to Gaelic Nova Scotia, since the body of Gaelic tradition founded as it is largely on sound, has always been and remains to be a, a powerful force for people here. In fact, had it not been for the persistence of its oral and musical traditions over the centuries, I doubt the language would have survived into our own time uh, here, here, and I mean in Nova Scotia, or possibly even in Scotland. Time and again in the field, in both countries, I have heard people directly or indirectly, thanking the generations before them who faithfully passed on their knowledge. We should also notice that nearly all the resources mentioned in the California model are available in Nova Scotia communities free of charge, thanks to the universal access to tradition that has been such an important part of the Gaelic world. To you, the use of such easily available resources may help to explain the fact that the Bonus Bar project expenditures 
came to considerably less than those projected in the financial section uh, of the extensive uh, 2013 report. Not a bad result for language and culture routinely regarded as a luxury in some funding circles. The benefits of the more organic approach may appear to some to be hard to quantify, but to anyone with the least knowledge of, of the Gaelic world, they are readily apparent. Looking back over the development of the apprentices, it is these people who have come to prominence in the present Gaelic movement in the province. Having spent years as a language teacher uh, in Nova Scotia and in Scotland, it has become clear, at least to me, that learners in Nova Scotia through this method have developed a command of the language that is more versatile, social, and at least as grammatically correct as book learning has produced in learners in Scotland. As was intended, the mentor relationships have led to, to close friendships that have healed some of the generation, generational and social divisions and communities that have come about through institutional life and language shift. Finally, in some of the program, uh, finally, some in the program have expressed a desire to remain here as part of the Gaelic community in Nova Scotia. I suspect this is because in spite of all the pressures, they have found a reason to stay that is stronger and more personal than all the usual reasons for leaving. Next slide, please. A number of the apprentices in Boon Bar came in with some working knowledge of spoken Gaelic, but there's also the matter of additional resources that have been put together. For young people who wish uh, to begin learning the language and want to connect with the tradition, the Gaelic College offers the, uh, the, uh, the Gaelic Mentorship Program for Youth and a good foundation for future learning. Uh, thank you. Um, Stora Savala, next slide, please. The Gaelic Folklife School is run by the Highland Village Museum and this past August has uh, completed its 2022 session. Its mission is to provide direct access to the region's Gaelic tradition, drawing on local tradition bearers, collectors and archive field work. Using the same methodology, the, ses the sessions are, conduct are conducted in Gaelic only and active participation is encouraged. Those attending are encouraged through exposure to the materials to develop the traditional skills of singing, storytelling and conversations so that they may one day participate in the transmission of Gaelic oral tradition. A high value is placed on the role of, of source tradition bearers and the accompanying information, often anecdotal about them. High value is also placed on um, the social experience and the relationships formed around acquiring material and skills and deploying them in performing. But what we really have here is a replication of the practices that have maintained Gaelic and Gaelic culture down to our own time on both sides of the Atlantic. And again, uh, the uh, to conclude, so where have an obscure proverb mentioned in passing decades ago and the story of an improbable but agile hero taken us? The proverbial advice coming to, to us this day can be read in the affirmation of regional Gaelic language and culture among ordinary people and supported as never before by our publicly funded institutions. This is not a product of romantic idealism as some would, uh, as some would have had us believe uh, not so long ago, but the product of solid development from the ground up. The language progress alone following years of unproductive efforts 
is unprecedented in Nova Scotia and in my view, unparalleled on the other side of the Atlantic. The goods recommend themselves is the proverb that the Gales would use, as will be evident at any Gaelic occasion today. Although a clear majority of participants in the programs have acquired a reading knowledge of Gaelic and many can now write it, book literacy in the language is not one of the primary outcomes, just ordinary language competence. In this Gaeltach, the days of Gaelic light via the dead language approach are over. A second part of the advice of the day has to do with social learning, leading to the renewal of social bonds between individuals and generations, the discovery and ownership of local traditions and, and validation of individual and community life. From the perspective of Gaelic social culture, this has for many generations been the context for the maintenance and transmission of the oral tradition. And it is astonishing that it should have been removed and supplanted in the name of, quote, community or, quote, education. A point becoming increasingly clear is that Gaelic is and should remain a part of the way of life of communities here. True, the numbers are small, but there has emerged a core body of the younger Gaelic speakers whose commitment to an investment in the Gaelic world is a clear indicator that they will not give it up. And in their lives and work, they will have growing support to draw on. As for our resourceful and perhaps legendary hero, he saw that the opportunities were not just those provided according to terms from the outside. They were there in one form or another all around him. He knew what he wanted and he got it. Okay, last, uh, last uh, slide, please. Many thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Hashin Fatener Coleman. Um, folks, you're very welcome to um, come off mute to share any thoughts or comments or pose any questions for Ian or for the group that you may have. Ian, you have a question. Um, like this, um, call me, um, in the end, uh, 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 um yeah and that, that was great and and uh i think apart from the the chimpanzee example i think i'd heard uh, most most of the points that you put forward uh in previous discussions um i'm i'm interested in um what what i see and, and this is this may be kind of uh anecdotal and also kind of spider spider sense kind of uh feeling that there's there's a broader um there's a broader phenomenon happening um that i think people are are, are attempting to reconnect with with their um heritage or their um linguistic and cultural identities and um my sense is that, that the programs that you highlighted are uh, wonderful examples of how 
uh, community members have engaged and really, you know, um, excelled in, in, in the community context through social learning opportunities. And then I think that there's um, like sort of a, a broader community and, and it's, it's often kind of comes down to resources um, that are keen to connect in as well and, and um, capitalize on opportunities like these um, programs, Bonus Bav, Nagash Kikov, and so on. And I, I, I guess my, my, my question or observation is, is that something that you sense? Is there a sort of um, uh, an, an element that, you know, we're, we're kind of, the technological age doesn't do it all for us. So we're, we're constantly in that, in that mixing place of trying to reconnect with, with our identities in, in some meaningful ways um, so that we can kind of feel like there is something really um, of significance and interest to be engaged in throughout our lives. And uh, yeah, I'd welcome any thoughts or comments. I'm not sure if it's a question or, or just an observation. Welcome your comments. Well, uh, what you're saying now is what I what, what I was trying to say over the past three quarters of an hour. Uh, but but I, th I think, uh, yes, uh, I don't think that uh, um, social media uh, is going to do it for a lot of us. Um, but I, I think also that uh, we should remember that um, uh, in the pre-technological age, things weren't very good uh, for Gales or, and, and maybe for a lot of other people. And uh, I, I, I agree with you uh, in, in, in thinking that um, uh, there has been, uh, uh, there's social changes going on, uh, which uh, uh, we had a former prime minister here in Britain who said, there is no such thing as society. Uh, and uh, uh, this, I, this I think, is uh, one direction that is is being stumbled down. Um, and and I, I see no silver bullet here, but I do see that there's an opportunity uh, for Gales to to select and develop what is good for them. And uh, the, uh, the rest of this stuff, uh, uh, I, I don't think uh, Gaeldom has ever really had the uh, ambition to solve the problems of the world, uh, but just start in a small way. And, th and that's really the way these programs have started in the first place. Um, uh, size is not important. Uh, the number of people is not the important thing so much, but what you do with what you have and having some kind of a, a, a plan, uh, a sense of where you're going, uh, which is another thing that uh, uh, some people feel is sadly lacking in uh, mainstream society. Mm -hmm. uh, to leave. Um, Ian, we've got a question here in the chat um, from Jenny, who has a poor connection. So I'll share that. And then we have um, Heather's also here and would like to say something. Um, Jenny says, thank you for your talk, Ian. Where do you perceive there to be crossover in such community groups with contemporary social justice issues? And to what extent is there a sense of engagement in these communities with contemporary Scotland, warts and all? Okay, well, um, the first part of it, uh, I, I think that uh, the, uh, in Nova Scotia, the, the situation, the Gaelic language has always been a contemporary social justice issue. And um, there is such a thing as language rights. And uh, this has been, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's been patronized, uh, but uh, the, the, the main issues uh, since the seventies, but also before um, when they, uh, when, when kids used to get, uh, you know, uh, uh, the ruler on the knuckles in the schools here for speaking English, 
uh, for speaking Gaelic in in the school, uh, it's always been it's always been a problem, and it it, it boils down to social justice. And now, uh, uh, many places, at least on the surface, are changing in their perspective, and that's good. Um, but I I think that uh, uh, people uh, should have the right to access to their community language. Um, even, even if it has been leached out of the community, uh, if it can be restored and they want it, uh, it should be done. Uh, you have to remember the, uh, uh, we have a tremendous advantage compared to some groups of people uh, who have been successful uh, in Israel, for instance. Uh, Hebrew was a religious language, uh, very much like Church Latin was. Um, but they managed to bring back their language. And if you go to Israel, you hear Hebrew all, all day, every day. So it can be done. The advantage we have is that there is a, a culture uh, which is um, closely aligned with the language, which is still accessible here. Um, as, as far as uh, connections with... Um, Scotland are concerned, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, both Gaeltas, uh have to learn from each other and have to help each other. And uh, uh, you can see the exchanges going on, the Keolis program in, in South Uist, uh where <clears throat> uh, Cape Bretoners, uh, uh, musicians come over and uh, uh, provide uh, that fiddle style and also the tunes, uh, many of which are uh, at, as close to the center of Gaelic uh, culture as the, as the popular tunes in the pubs here. And also outlets for uh, publishing and so on in, in, in Scotland um, for uh, post-secondary education uh, through Gaelic. Uh, Scotland can be quite helpful. So there are these areas uh, where we can uh, we can help each other. Morning, Tang. Shino, over to you, Heather. Tapalif Ian Air Center Ur Aura Chegas Hai Homa via Huinchin Voivsha and Ju. Um I so appreciate such a, a very inspiring and and hopeful and optimistic sort of overview of, of how things have come to where we are today um, here in Nova Scotia. And I guess what I'm curious to know about is what do you think needs to happen next? So do you feel that, are, do, have we figured out what we need to do? We just need to keep on with it and grow what we're doing? Is Or if there was big sky thinking, like you could have anything is there something else that we should be thinking about doing next that would help us to take that next step forward? Uh, in, in a general way, um, and this is based really just on my own experience, I think that there has to be a, a continuation of the effort and, and an increased effort uh, of, of ground up uh, uh, movement and, and activity uh, and less um, obeisance uh, to uh, uh, priorities uh, imposed from the top down, which is really what democracy is about is from my understanding of it. And uh, uh, it, it, I think it's really um, bringing people together around Gaelic in communities, even if uh, even if you're dealing with one or two people who can speak it and the rest can't, uh, but with this awareness, um, some of the rest who are not Gaelic speakers will become Gaelic speakers. And frankly, uh, I've noticed with people once you can speak the language, your politics around um, language rights uh, do change. Uh, very quickly, uh, because you 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 understand the way it really works, and uh, that that there are uh, 
priorities um, or um, uh, agendas uh, from the outside that, that do need to be questioned and they should be. And uh, this, can, this can all be done in the nicest way possible. But uh, that's what that's what I see is is, is community community cohesion. Uh, and uh, again, I think uh, uh, Highland Village uh, and uh, the, the the initiative recent initiatives, especially from the Gaelic College, are are beginning to tap into this in in ways that are going that are already producing uh, I think remarkable results and. Uh, the cost uh, to the province. I mean, I, I suppose someone should go back and uh, uh, review books like Tartanism Triumphant, uh, just to see what the costs were to uh, the government in Nova Scotia of uh, uh, the uh, the Highland Gathering, Gathering of the Clans, uh, and uh, compare the costs compare the results and see what's really going on in terms of uh, the financial uh, uh, arguments that you so often hear when uh, uh, you uh, uh, try to promote uh, these uh, little, what people used to call frills and luxuries. Uh, I don't see them that way at all. And, and there have been studies done in Brittany, uh, which have to do with um, language loss and uh, what happens uh, to ordinary people as reflected in the, the statistics in the institutions. And what you have in these areas that have recently lost their community language is um, more crime, more alcoholism, more prostitution, less kids in school, uh, huge health problems. Um, and, uh, the uh, the moral that I would see coming out of that is it would probably be it would have been cheaper for the French government, from what I've read, to actually uh, finance regional cultures and co community cultures and so on than it is to take care of all of the victims of these processes. So uh, I, I doubt very much that this is really a question of money. Top leave, Ian. Pichel, no more Hello, John. Thanks for the uh, the lovely talk. It's nice to see you again. Uh, I just wanted to really strongly support uh, the, the observation you made early in your talk about the uh, elements of the culture that have kind of quietly slipped into the modern era without maybe being recognized. Uh, yeah. Over the years, I've read, I don't know, maybe 200 community and parish histories. They're absolutely gold mines of information. So here's one of them, uh, very well known to people in Inverness County, the history of Inverness yeah. County. And on the surface, this looks like a classic, you know, work of English culture it's a book it's written it's in the english language it tells us about you know economic activity and geography and so on but almost this entire book is about the people who settled in there particularly the gales but but the people who they are where do they come from uh how are they connected uh, so their sense of community comes through really powerfully here and from my understanding jl mcdougall didn't collect a lot of that stuff he had a a, 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 a kind of an apprentice or a friend who would go and get this material in Gaelic uh, orally, commit it to memory, and then recite it to J.L. McDougall, who would then write it up, and that formed the basis of the uh, of this mm -hmm. history. So, you know, the ethos of the Gales, I think, came through there. Some of the cultural methodology of, you know, oral tradition came through. Uh, so it's nice to see how many of these things have come through. Uh, and I'm just curious, John, is there one of these items that maybe you know doesn't fit the traditional mold of what Gaelic should be but really is a part a really strong part of our culture that you think uh is something that we can really leverage that maybe we haven't paid as much attention to as, as we could uh yeah I um 
we uh, certainly at um, uh, Stara Savala, uh, we've we've read we've we've uh, used local publications, uh, Gaelic publications, but uh, um, genealogies. Uh, I believe uh, they're keys. It, it's not it's not uh, just some kind of dry science. Um, but uh, at least what it has done traditionally, when I was staying in Glendale with Father Janangus and uh, the uh, the Beatons from uh, Porstban, uh, and you'd hear these uh, genealogies rhymed off, uh, what they were really about was a key to anecdotes about people. They, 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 they were the, the, um, the index that was used to get to the internal history of any community. And again, that was all oral, but it's exactly the same, same stuff that's in McDougal. And yeah, there's, uh, there's a great finally, uh, um, uh, it, it, uh, it, it scared me at the time but I began to sit down and, and read people like McDougal so, so that I could follow what, what these people were saying <laughs> about their own parts of the, uh, parts of the uh, island. And it was very helpful. I, I had an experience in Scotland with Alan McDonald, you know, of Glenuig, Alan the Whaler, and we were just, just, having a beer and talking in the pub and ship swapping stories. And then he, he started to laugh and because there's a crew of us, there's three or four of us there from our side. And he said, you are like the old people. Every story you tell, it's not a joke. It's not like a priest, a rabbi, a minister. It's always about somebody in particular and you have to tell who they are first. And that seems to be what sets the humor off. You have to kind of know, know the people. So it always struck me that that's part of that. It's just, it seems to remind people, of their connections and who created things and and that sort of thing yeah oh back in the 60s uh, uh you you may have heard of katie florence kennedy um I, I i was staying at their house and katie florence was uh she was a big help and one day a a, a woman uh knocked at the screen door it was summer and katie florence let her in and they sat down she, she didn't know the woman at all and they were talking about this and that and kind of trying to understand. Uh, she, she couldn't quite understand why the woman was there and what, what was going on. And, and I was uh, listening to all this and the uncertainty uh, that uh, uh, was building up around this visit. And they started talking about uh, where the woman came from. And then Kate, Katie Florence would say, oh, yeah. I've 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 heard of the place and I've there th this family and that family and so on, and they started building back and they went back about three or four generations, and they found they were related, and of course the whole thing relaxed after that. Uh, the the cosmic order had been had been established, and uh, the conversation flowed. So again, um, all these things uh, that they. They facilitate social exchanges and uh, social bonds. Uh, if it's not one, if it's not uh, genealogy, it's music, or if it's not music, it's stories or songs. And this is uh, this this is what I would see um, as being one of the things I would see as being important to build on uh, for communities to have renewed access uh, to their to their traditions to their life the knowledge Akusha room is good I very much enjoyed that talk and I just thought I'd like to come off mute for a moment to um, affirm one of the points you made um, in the mentorship program that the, the relationships that were built between apprentices and mentors really had a healing impact. And yeah. I, I can really testify to that in my 
own experience. I, I've had a really good fortune um, to be in many kitchens with elders and, and visiting, and some at various stages of um, using their own language. Um, and so I've seen some people through visits just come back to life and blossom. And um, some of these, you know, Anna McKinnon will often say, but a big you know, if it wasn't for the Gaelic folk, I, I, I'm, I'd be dead here. Um, stuff and but a big like I, I'd be dead. And, and I, I think she's quite serious um, when she says that. And so, um, and I've heard Mickey John H. speak of it as well. You know, I thought Gaelic was dead. I, I thought it was gone. And then along came Seamus Watson and now you're here. And, um, you know, and, and there's a sense that they are leaving a, a legacy and having an impact. And I think that that is uh, very meaningful for them. So I, I wanted to affirm that and also to say that participating in Gaelic language and culture has really contributed to my own healing and, and resiliency. And um, the last point I wanted to make was just talking about the genealogies. Um, it was critical in my mentorship um, um, with Anna that I learn her people and the people of her place and the people of her area. And it was kind of strange in a way because it would be generations back and, and just over time and many, many, many stories, um, I did get to know those genealogies and the connections and the handles, the swanyags, the, the patronymics. And um, if we'd be at the co-op and run into somebody, well, I, I would know through Anna, their grandparents or, or great grandparents. So, and boy, oh boy, we might've went in to get bananas at the co-op and we'd be there 90 minutes because we had to play each person um, in their genealogies. And um, it, it was a steep learning curve, but I, I really did feel that I got to know those families. And, you know, a year or two after that, I, I did a mentorship with Mickey John H over in Balahamish, which is, you know, it's a world away. It's another world. And I, I sort of had to start from scratch. I was like, oh, I don't know anybody. I'm not, I'm not grounded here. I don't know the families. And, but over, you know, visits and stories, I began to have a sense of the people of that place and, and, and how they were connected. So I um, just wanted to share that, that belief. If there's a maybe a final comment or question, we might have time to squeak it in and maybe we covered it all. Well, it's it, just to uh, say it. Uh, in parting, it, it, it's going to be very interesting, uh, considering what's in place now, and considering that uh, we have uh, a good number of new speakers, uh, um, that uh, it's going to be interesting to see what programs are going to be uh, put together. Um, I would say it's important that things keep on moving uh, in a certain direction. Uh, for example, uh, with what I've had experience with it in the program, which is almost entirely uh, uh, things should keep moving in the direction of, of uh, uh, making people like me obsolete because there are other people coming up who are going to be doing that work and possibly doing it much better. Um, but this is this is the way uh, this is the way it could it should work. Um, uh, we have to train people uh, as, as 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 part of being reacculturated. And uh, uh, another another thing is uh, and it's happening. Uh, uh, to to some extent, bringing in families, 
it would be interesting to know how many uh, families in Cape Breton now use Gaelic with their children. I mean, I could count them on one hand uh, when, when we left in 1990. Uh, I would suspect that there are more than that now. So that uh, uh, kids, uh, once again, well, they're going to school uh, bilingual. Uh, if, if, uh, if, if there is some Gaelic at home, Well, I think we've come to a close for this afternoon. Mavila Tang Okov Ian, Agus, Mila Tang Aishir Sanchian. Thank you so much, Ian, and thank you everybody for coming. And um, hopefully, there'll be another community lecture as part of Stora Savala um, and Avlena. Um, I guess we imagine if.